Good morning. Welcome to St. Louis Chinese Gospel Church. We're so glad that you can join with us this morning in our worship. Um, this morning, Pastor Paul is going to be continuing uh, from what he spoke about last week, which is protection from God. And, you know, during this time with so many things going on, with not just COVID, but now with uh, the social unrest uh, arising out of uh, the tragic incident that happened in Minnesota. Many of us, you know, are maybe a little bewildered. Maybe a, a lot of us are not sure what to do. And, you know, one of the comforting things is that God does give us protection. Um, we can be smart about what we do in terms of wearing masks and social distancing and et cetera, et cetera. And we can act safe, but ultimately it's God who provides us protection. And one of the things Pastor Paul will be talking about is stressing the importance of prayer. Um, you know, we can do all these things from a human standpoint, but at the end of the day, we need to pray. And so we look forward to hearing from Pastor Paul this morning. So as we begin our worship, our call uh, to worship this morning comes from Psalms 27, verses 1 and 5. And it says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble and conceal me under the cover of his tent. I want to share with you real quickly um, this week uh, prior to our confession. Um, you know, our sister Barb Ho sent uh, some of us a text and something that she was really convicted about. And it had to do with uh, Nehemiah's prayer in, in Nehemiah chapter 1. And when I got it, I immediately uh, turned to it because I'm not really working much. But <laughs> so I had time to immediately turn to it and um, read it, read it again, read it again. And it really sunk in. And I, and I really want to thank Barb uh, for sharing that uh, with us. And it, it, it really talks about how sinful we are um, and how corrupt we've become and how we really need to turn to God. So as we read our confession this morning, let's think about that. And um, anyway, our, our confession is Psalms 27, verse 7 and 9. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me or turn your servant away in anger. So let's spend a moment in prayer, and then I'm going to pray, and um, I hope it's okay with you. I've kind of taken the liberty to take a version of ne the prayer of Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1 and written it into a prayer, and hopefully it'll speak to all of you like it spoke to us. So let's just spend a moment sil silently confessing. Lord God of heaven, you are great and awesome, and you faithfully keep your promises to everyone who loves you and obeys your commands. We are your servants, so please have mercy on us and hear our prayers that we make day and night for the people who serve you and the world around us. We have all acted corruptly and sinned against you by choosing to disobey you and your laws and teachings. We plead and cry out to you to remember the promise you made to Moses. You told him if we were unfaithful, you would scatter us among the nations. But you also said that no matter how far away we were, we could turn back to you and start obeying your commands. Then you would bring us back to the place where you have chosen to be worshipped. Lord, we pray and thank you for all of your servants particularly those who, that you have rescued from destruction by your great strength and power. Please answer our prayers and the prayers of all your people who gladly serve and honor your name. In your son's glorious name, amen. Our assurance um, is from Psalms 27, verse 8. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. 
So as we go forward this week and, the, and in the weeks to come, let's really spend the time that we need to seek God's face. And as we'll hear this morning from Pastor Paul, as long as we are seeking God's face and going to him, he will protect us from whatever may come our way. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.
this is our God. He brings peace to our madness and comfort in our sadness. This is our God. So call upon His name. He is mighty to save. This is our Um, good morning. I had wanted to talk today, uh, kind of a continuation from last week about God's promises to protect us, and one of the great psalms that talks about God protecting us, and I think one that is very, very applicable for now, is Psalm 91, and this is the psalm that Martin Luther got A Mighty Fortress is Our God from, is the opening of this, and the Psalm 91 is really interesting because he talks about God protecting us, but he protects us from one of two things. He protects us from disease and pestilence, if you will, epidemics, and he protects us from violence. And I think in the last few weeks, you know, we've seen not only have we suffered a pandemic that is ravaging people around the world, but also, you know, uprising and violence in our streets. And so I wanted to look at this as just saying, you know, if we are safe, that is, we do everything the medical professions teach us to do, face mask and thing, social distancing, washing our hands, and if we stay away from areas that are not safe, 
where there's a little bit of violence, and we seek God in prayer. And see, that's the thing, is to seek God in prayer, God will protect us. Um, although, I will say to you that as I have done this preparation for this morning, God has really convicted me to go in a different direction, and so I pray that you'll forgive me if it seems a little off from what I say right now, but that's because God has been really speaking to me, and he spoke to me through the words of one man, and that is, uh, somebody asked me, why didn't we pray for George Floyd's family? Why did we not pray for George Floyd's family? And, and you know, that's really hit home, because I did not pray for George Floyd's family. And as I've learned some things, then I've realized, wow, you know, maybe we need to really grab a hold of God's heart, uh, God's heart who is broken, uh, for a man who is a child of his, who was brutally murdered, and uh, whose brother has come out and said, we don't want violence, we're a God-fearing family. Um, so Psalm 91 is a really interesting one because it's one of those psalms where it follows a pattern where what is in the very beginning verse and what is at the end verse are parallel, and then the main point is right in the very, very middle. And so we're going to do that. We're going to look at the beginning, we're going to look at the end, and we're going to look at the beginning, or the, uh, the middle. And the middle is the high point. It's the main point of the psalm. Here he says, He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High God, he also dwells, he abides, he lives in the shadow of the Almighty. So there's the shelter of the Most High God, shadow of the Almighty, they're parallel. And then the psalmist goes on to talk about himself. I will say to Yahweh, to my God, my refuge and my fortress. And this is where Martin Luther wrote that psalm, I mean that song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. My refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then what I want you to notice is he promises and it gives us assurance of God's protection and deliverance from two things, violence and disease, epidemic. So uh, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, which is a metaphor for people trying to capture you and trick you and actually do you harm or even kill you deceitfully. But he will deliver you not only from the snare of the fowler, but also from deadly disease. He will cover you with his pinions, and you will find refuge under his wings. You'll find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. And we all know what a shield is in the ancient days, but a buckler is actually like a small sword. So he's a shield that protects us, but he also has the sword that fights for us. It's a metaphor for God protecting us. And then right in the middle of the psalm. So I'm going to jump from the beginning to the end, and these next verses are from right in the middle. It's the high point. It's a triangle. Beginning, end, or parallel. What's at the top in the middle is actually the main point. This is the main point. He says, because you've made the Lord, Yahweh, your dwelling place, because you made the Most High God my refuge, he's my refuge, his personal refuge, therefore God is going to do two things. No evil is going to fall you. You're going to be safe from violence, and no plague will come upon you. There's no epidemic uh, disease that will come to you. So he will protect. But then we go to the very end, and it's very clear from the psalmist that his protection also depends and is conditioned upon our seeking God actively in prayer. And that's the problem is so many times we do what is right and think that we will protect ourselves and we do not go to God in prayer. Or we assume that God will protect us and we don't do what's nice, we don't do what's smart, we don't do what's wise, and we don't go to God in prayer. And so it's based on an assumption. And so this kind of steals all those assumptions away from us that if we protect ourselves, we don't need God God will take care of us. We don't need to be smart, but they're both necessary. But at the very end, there's this condition. Because, that is the condition, he holds fast to me in love, that is, you and I hold fast to God in love, 
this is God speaking, I will deliver him and I will protect him. Why? Because he knows my name. And so there's kind of a structure here of this Hebrew poetry. He holds fast to me, therefore I will deliver him. Because he knows my name, therefore I will protect him. And then here's the most important condition. When he calls to me in prayer, when he comes to me in prayer, I will answer. So prayer becomes the crucial way that God helps us. And then he goes on to say, I will be with him in trouble and I will rescue him and I will honor him and I will show him my salvation. And I just pray, uh, let me pray real quickly. God, I pray that you will help me speak clearly um, and I pray that you'll help me speak from what you've shown me and what you've convicted me of in the heart rather than what I had originally intended. And I pray that you'll help me to make it clear and we, God, will have your heart, a heart, God, that is broken, a heart, God, that is filled with love for your children, but a heart, God, that cares um, for those who suffer, and a heart, God, that is not just concerned about our own safety and our own security. In your name we pray. Amen. So, um, I kind of want to say something. You know, I studied international relations, and part of that is that you study a lot of history, and one of the things that you learn in history is that there's just these cycles, cycles of war, cycles of social upheaval, cycles of epidemics and pandemics, and they just happen over and over and over again. And, you know, Jesus kind of told us that these things would happen over and over and over again, and that it's not the end, you know, that these things are just going to happen. They're part of history. Um, but, you know, right now, sometimes people feel like, wow, I've never seen anything, and not in my lifetime have I ever seen, you know, a pandemic like this, even though scientists have been telling us for decades that some kind of pandemic would be here like this, and that there have been many pandemics, and we've never seen kind of violence in our streets, although, actually, if you know anything about history, or you can even remember back to the 1960s, there were a lot of uh, upheavals in the streets, but I kind of want to go back 100 years and kind of remind you that we will get through this. And one of the ways that we know that we'll get through this is that these things happen over and over again, but God gets us through them. But that this is part of living in a fallen world. And so I want to take you back to 100 years ago, and you got to think, you know, there was World War I in which there was this war to end all wars, and, you know, American troops went over to France and fought. And, you know, 25% of all of the young male population of Europe was killed. I'm sorry, that is an extraordinary number of people. Then the American troops come back to the United States and are doing what soldiers all over the world are doing as they go home, is that they're bringing with them the Spanish flu. So they return in 1919... Uh, and they bring the Spanish flu, and then the Spanish flu begins to spread, which killed anywhere from 50 million to 100 million people around the world. And then these black African-American soldiers that went to fight for democracy, which is why they went to war, they come back and they think, oh, wait, you know, we've been fighting for democracy, we should have our civil rights, and then so they start acting as though they have civil rights. And then 1919 becomes sort of the year of, they call it the year of the red or the summer of red. And what they meant by calling 1919 the year of red is that there was so much blood of white supremacists and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan killing African Americans and having race riots in cities across the United States that there was just violence everywhere. So there's war, there's this epidemic, this pandemic around the world, and then social upheaval, protests. But the worst racial violence that occurred in the U.S. history took place in what is called the Black Wall Street. That is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so all of these African Americans come back and they're getting education, and they're becoming professionals. And Tulsa, Oklahoma had a section called Greenwood, 
and it was referred to as the Black Wall Street. It's probably better off to call it the Black Main Street, but it was a really successful area, and as there was the oil boom in Oklahoma, and money started to flow, but African Americans were not allowed to shop or to have their stores with Caucasians, and they were segregated, they all came to this area called Greenwood. And so they've started to become very, very prosperous, very prosperous. One of the most prosperous areas among African Americans in the United States was in Greenwood at Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then in 1921, in 1921, uh, a young shoe shiner, a man, young man, he goes to the only building in downtown T Tulsa, Oklahoma, where African Americans, where colored people are allowed to use a restroom. And he goes up to this floor and he gets into an elevator and there's a white girl and something happened and we don't know what, nobody knows what it was, but he bumped her, he touched her, you know, the elevator jerk. We really have no idea what happened. Nobody knows what happened because she never pressed charges. She never detailed anything. But the rumor got out that he had assaulted and he had raped her and he was arrested and brought to jail. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of white men go down. They want to, you know, drag him out and lynch him. And some African-Americans go down there and they want to protect him. And before you know it, in Greenwood, Black Wall Street, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of white people come down and they've got all their guns, they've got their machine guns, and they start burning and they start shooting and they start mowing people down and shooting people with machine guns and they burn down the church, that's Mount Zion Baptist Church, and they burn the whole entire neighborhood down. They burned every single building down. They killed approximately 300 people. Planes flew over and they dropped bombs from above onto these buildings and they burned the whole entire thing to the ground. And then what they did was they dug mass graves and tried to cover it up. Mass graves that tried to cover it up and we're actually approaching, you know, what is the 100th anniversary and a few years ago the mayor of Tulsa they start looking for this mass grave. What is my point? What is my point? Pandemics, wars, famines, upheaval, protest are cyclical in history, just like Jesus predicted that they would, that they would always be there, and that as evil as they are, we need to find our hope in God. Not in our guns, but in God. We need to really seek God and his protection because these things happen throughout all of human history. So we need to be safe, we need to be smart, and we need to seek God. And we can be smart by doing everything, wearing our masks, wearing our gloves, washing our hands, keeping social distance. We could be smart and safe by staying away from areas where there is violence. But what God tells us, this is the thing, what God tells us is that he will provide protection if we seek him in prayer. If we seek him in prayer. We cannot assume. We cannot be presumptuous. We have to seek God in prayer. And so he says here, you, right in the very middle of this psalm, you made the Lord your dwelling place. You made him my refuge. You made him my refuge. This is the place where I go to hide, to find security. And he promises two things. No evil will befall you, that you will be safe and protected from violence, and no plague will come near you. So God provides these assurances, but as we'll see as we get to the third point, that he protects us from disease, he protects us from violence, but we have to go to him in prayer to get, gain those things. And so let me just quickly look at this. So here he says, you, in the very beginning, you protect us from disease, that God covers us. And this is kind of a repeat of last week, and so let me go through it really quickly. And what he says here is that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, and when he talks about the shelter of the Most High, it's kind of a, a metaphor for going up to Jerusalem and going to the temple, and you kind of hide in the temple. And you hide and abide and live in the shadow of the Almighty. So you get kind of two things, protection in the temple, and then the metaphor of hiding in God 
as an eagle. And you got to remember, this comes out because God said at Mount Sinai, you saw how I bore you out on eagle wings. So God bearing Egypt, the uh, people of Israel, out of Egypt on eagle's wings becomes a metaphor for God's rescuing and protection. And so here he says, you know, I will cover you with his pinions. And, you know, pinions are kind of the claws if that eagles or that hawks have, that birds have. I will cover you. I'll protect you so that other things don't come down. And you will find refuge under his wings. Now, this is a really important thing. And I thought about this all week. Because when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the last week, right before he was killed, what he said as he wept over Jerusalem, as he cried, knowing what would happen, the Romans would come in the year 70 AD for the three years siege of the city. What Jesus said is he's, as he wept, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers her children, her chicks under her wings. But you were unwilling. You were unwilling to come to me. You were unwilling to accept me as your Messiah. You were unwilling to recognize who I am. You were unwilling to come to me in prayer. So he offers us protection, but it requires a willingness on our part to come to Jesus as our Messiah, to come to Jesus as our Savior, and to seek refuge from him. And he promises here in Psalm 91 to deliver us from pestilence. And you got to remember, pestilence in the Old Testament was part of the curses that were laid out. There were the curses and the blessings, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Pestilence was part of God's curses for sin. But he says, if you seek me, I will deliver you from the curse. I will deliver you and I will protect you. So here what he says is, I will, he will deliver you from deadly pestilence that is an epidemic or a pandemic. And you got to think about this. It says you don't have to fear the pestilence. And here he talks about it stalking around, like hiding around and coming into people's homes at night in the darkness. Or the destruction that kind of slowly comes through people's villages and homes and just kind of lays people away so no plague will come near you. No plague will come near you. So this is just a repeat of last week, but we got to seek God in prayer. If we want protection, we have to do everything, everything that the medical scientists tell us that we need to do. But we also have to seek God in prayer, and that is the third point. But I want to come to the second point, and this is where God has really caused me to struggle all week. I have struggled and I've wrestled this because I wanted to come and I wanted to say, look, God will protect us from disease. God will protect us from violence. God will protect us from disease. God will protect us from violence. But as I thought about it, you know, I got to think, you know, we got to really wrestle with what this means. We have to really, really, really wrestle with God, and we have to have his heart, and a heart that is actually broken for those who suffer injustice. So he starts out here, and he says, God is my refuge, and God is my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And refuge and fortress is, is in the ancient world, a symbol of walled cities, that when they had warfare, and the armies would come down, whether they would be the Egyptians that would come from the south, or the Assyrians that would come from the north, or the Babylonian army that would come from the east, that what would happen is everybody that were on, on these farms and these villages, they would hear of these troops that were coming, these rumors would spread, and they would leave their homes, and they would all go to Jerusalem or to one of the big fortified cities that had walls all the way around, and the walls were walls of protection. And then they would defend themselves from the top of these walled cities. And that's what God is. God is a walled city. That's what it means when it says the Lord is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. It was the same in the Middle Ages 
when Martin Luther wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, they also had castles and walled cities. So Martin Luther understood this. We don't have it. But notice what he says. I will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And the fowler is actually a hunter who hunts birds. And they would set up traps or they would set up a pit or they would set up nets. And the birds would come along and then they would capture them. They would snap the, the, the noose or the net would fall or the birds would kind of get trapped. Either way, it's a way that God would protect people because it becomes a metaphor for others that are trying to capture us and do us harm. And then he uses this metaphor that God in his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. So if you and I are a believer, and you and I are a follower of Jesus, there is this assurance that if we come to God in prayer, he will protect us. We are safe in him from violence. And that's what I wanted to tell you to begin with. But all week I have wrestled. All week I have wrestled. I've really struggled this week. You know, we all know the turmoil that has gone on for the last two weeks. We know the turmoil that has gone on for the last two weeks. And that's what I wanted to say is that God will protect us from this kind of a turmoil. That we'll get through it. God will protect us. But I've had to really wrestle. Somebody asked me, why did we not pray for George Floyd's family? And that's haunted me in the back of my mind. And then I have found out George Floyd is not just one more unarmed African-American man that is killed by those small minority of brutal police. You know, the vast majority of police officers are really good, and I am sure that... The people that are the most outraged are law enforcement officers that always do things right, that are angry because of these few bad apples. <sighs> but there's something different here. And God has really spoken to me. You know, I learned that George Floyd actually was a Christian. You know, and I find articles that actually when he was in Houston... He had a lot of struggles, but he was involved with a ministry called Resurrection Houston. And you can see him back there, and he's got his Bible, you know, up there. And, and in Resurrection Houston, you know, they would go and they would work with the gangs. And one of the things that he has quoted in an Instagram that reveals where his heart was is he says in Instagram, I don't care what hood you're from. You know, this is not the kind of English I, I use, but I don't care what hood you're from, where are y'all at. But notice this, I love you. God loves you, put them guns down. I love you, God loves you, put them ga guns down. That's why George Floyd's brother came out and said, we don't want to see violence on the street, we want to see justice for our brother, but we don't want to see violence. That's not what he would have wanted because he had spent much of his life in a ministry trying to get gangs out of gangs and trying to end violence. And he goes up to Minnesota to try to get a job because he's trying to get his life together. And yeah, he's got sins. Yeah, he falls. He's got problems. But you and I have problems. And yet here is this man. And he ends up, just like any of us easily could, with a counterfeit bill in his pocket. He hands it off. And the police come. And he stumbles. And then all of a sudden, he's on the ground. And he's got... Two police officers lying on his back, crushing his thorax so that he can't breathe, and then another man on his neck, squeezing the blood supply to his head for eight minutes. And what's the outrage? You know, I just sit and I look and I think, here's this man who cries out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And it's obviously not a threat. If this man was a threat, no police officer, Derek Chauvin, would not be sitting there with his hands in his pocket. He would not be there with a calm look. He obviously felt no threat whatsoever. But my struggle this week has been this. If 
George Floyd was a believer in Christ, and he is calling out to these police officers, I can't breathe, I assume that he also, in his heart, was praying to God to rescue him. And so we have this verse here where I am trying to say, the psalmist in Psalm 91 says, God will protect us from violence, but here's a brother in Christ, and this is what I have struggled with. This is a brother in Christ. This man is a brother in Christ. We should be outraged. Not just because he's an unarmed black man. Yes, we should be outraged because of that. Not just because he's killed unjustly, but also, also, and they all go together because he's a brother in Christ. And this is what God has kind of convicted me of is, look, Paul, suddenly you get upset and suddenly you see he's a brother in Christ and you should be a little bit more upset. Well, if he's a brother in Christ and you're upset, why aren't you upset if he's an African-American? You know, if he's a brother in Christ and God cares for him, if he's African-American and he's created in the image of God, why aren't I bothered? Why aren't we not bothered? And so I have really struggled. What do you say about this? What do you say? Now, I want to ask you this question. This is what I have asked. What do you say to this man's young six-year-old daughter about this particular Bible verse? I don't know. I do not know if his daughter, Gianna, was to come to me as her pastor in 10 years and say, why did God allow my father to be killed? My father was a believer in Jesus. Why did not God protect? I cannot answer that question. I do not know. Because here he says, God is also just. He'll protect you, and you should not fear terror at night or the arrows by day. But I think the only way that I could talk to this young girl who would say to me, why did God allow my father to be murdered when he didn't really do anything wrong and he is a follower of God and those people sat on him for almost nine minutes for two and a half minutes after he's unresponsive. Why did God allow that to happen? I don't know. But what I do know that I can say is that the verse here says that God is just. I can't say to her, if your father was a believer in Jesus Christ, that right now he is in the presence of God. He is a child of God and he is in heaven in the presence of God and that he wants you to be there with him. So do not give up on God. But secondly, I would look at verse 8 and I would say to her, you will look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. You're going to see God as a just God judging evil and wicked men. And you may not see it in our legal system. We might, we might not. You know, we don't know what this man's, these police officers, attorneys will do to try to figure out a way to say that he wasn't really murdered. And they'll argue probably a lot about what was the cause of death I don't know. He could. But the thing is, God promises that he will judge. And so what I do know is that those men, if they do not repent, that even if they get off by a legal system, that God himself will judge them on the day of judgment. And finally, God protects through prayer. And I don't know, not know how to talk to a six-year-old girl about losing her father. And so I kind of want to turn this point. This is what God has actually asked me to do. Why did I not pray for this man's family? Why do I pray for our government leaders? Why do I pray for peace on the streets? Why do I pray for the pandemic to come to an end, but I don't pray for this man's family? I think we need to all pray for this man's family. I think God's heart is broken because a child of his was murdered. 
And I think we need to pray for his family. That's all I'm going to ask you this morning, is that you take time to pray for his family. God protects through prayer. And I want us to pray that God will protect this young six-year-old girl. You see, here, God, at the very end of the psalm, puts out sort of the conditions of God's protection. Since, because he holds fast to me in love, then I will deliver him. That's why he holds fast to me. I'm going to rescue him. Since he knows my name, he has a relationship with me, and he knows my character, I will protect him. But then he goes on to say that prayer is the means that we reach out to God. So he says to us, when you or if you call out to me, that's conditional. If you call out to me in prayer, then I will answer you. Don't be presumptuous about God. It's when you call out to me, I will answer. And I will be with him in trouble, and I will rescue him, and I will show him my salvation. And so I do not know what to do, but I'm going to tell you what God has spoken to me today. God has spoken. I've spent this week, and I started out with one sermon, and God gave me another, and I'm just going to tell you what God told me to do. God told me to look at the face of a six-year-old girl who has lost her father. A six-year-old girl whose father was a follower of Jesus Christ. God has told me to pray for her. God has spoken to me and convicted me and asked me why am I so concerned about my own safety? Why am I concerned about my own security? And I pray for that, and I see this young girl who is so broken, who is and now an orphan. And what does God say about himself? God says that he is a father to the fatherless, that he is a protector of two kinds of people, the orphans, the widows, the aliens, and the poor. And here is the orphan, broken in tears. And so I just have one thing that I want you to do this week. And it's actually, I think, a test of whether our heart is in line with God's heart. Will you pray for this girl? And pray that or another God will heal her, that God will rescue her, that God will protect her, and that she will come to some kind of resolution in her heart with God, and that she will somehow or another come to peace and faith in God, who for whatever reason allowed her father to be murdered. Pray that God will work in the heart of this young girl. What God told me, what God convicted me, is that this will be a way that I will show whether or not I have a heart that is broken like Jesus' heart. So I pray that we would all desire justice, that we would all desire safety and security, but we would all have a broken heart looking at this young girl. Let me pray. God, I do pray for Gianna. Lord, and, and I confess to you, Lord, that I've prayed for many things, but it was not until others pointed out to me that I did not pray for George Lloyd and his family that you convicted me. And I pray that you will convict all of us. And I pray, God, that you will bring peace to our country. You will bring unity to our country. And I pray that you, God, will bring healing to this young girl 
and to the whole entire Floyd family, the God-fearing family that has asked that they get justice, but asked that there be no violence. And I pray, God, that you will be with them and that you will keep them in your faith and not allow them to feel that you have abandoned them and that you have betrayed them. In your name I pray, amen. So for benediction, I would like to encourage us to really think about unity. Our country needs unity. Our country needs unity more than anything else, and unity only comes through Jesus Christ. So as Keith had earlier prayed a prayer of confession, it is repentance upon the heart of the people of, of Hib. Their confession, our confession, your confession, repentance, and preaching of the gospel is the only thing that will rescue us. The gospel is the only thing that changes people's hearts, and I pray that we will do it. And I pray that we, God, will do so in unity. So let me pray. May the God of steadfastness and the God of encouragement grant you to live in harmony, that is to live in unity, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So may God be with you this week, and may you really choose to seek him in prayer. And I pray that God will move all of us to pray. Amen.